leg up and setting up his machine. So um, Dr. Russell has a wonderfully eclectic uh, uh, resume, as you saw. So he's a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. So thank you for making the, the trek out here. Um, you saw an excerpt from his textbook, which was pretty cool. And uh, you'll also notice on his resume that he has worked with the UN. So he's got um, pretty, uh, pr pretty eclectic background. So with that, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Fred. Um, so I've been given the task of covering the whole of the future of artificial intelligence in 30 minutes. Uh, so let me begin by saying what it is. And um, we all know it's about making machines intelligent. And for some time, maybe about 30 years, uh, we've understood that to mean machines that, that do the right thing, that optimize uh, the selection of actions in pursuit of their objectives or optimize expected value uh, in economic terms. And I put an asterisk on that because I'm going to tell you later that that's the wrong definition. Uh, and we've been barking, on, barking up slightly the wrong tree uh, as a result of this. And I take some of the blame for that. Um, I do want to point out that it has a, a very large uh, range of topics. Uh, and some of the previous speakers have pointed out the, the overemphasis on deep learning. So deep, deep learning is one sub-sub-subfield of machine learning. Uh, and this is not to, to uh, minimize the importance of what's happened in the last five years or so, uh, but actually to point out that you could see similar advances happening in any of the other subfields. Uh, and having similar uh, magnitude of impact um, on the capabilities of AI systems. Um, and I couldn't, uh, couldn't resist putting in one of the impressive examples. This is a picture uh, from uh, a Google blog post from uh, Sami Benjo's uh, group with Ariel Vinyals and others. Um, and uh, this, this task is uh, producing captions for images. And here's the caption, a group of people shopping at an outdoor market. There are many vegetables at the fruit stand. Um, and this is shown as one of the sort of crowning achievements of the deep learning community. But notice that there is no group of people, uh, that nobody is shopping at all, uh, and there is no fruit stand. So, uh, so I think that illustrates that, that sometimes you can, take, you can go a bridge too far. You can try to, to learn by supervised learning a, a mapping that is, that is too complex, that has intermediate stages, for example, the recognitions of objects, the recognitions of spatial relations uh, and interpersonal relations in, in the scene and so on. Uh, and sometimes if you try to bridge it all, all the way from the image to a caption, uh, you can go too far. Uh, and now I think the community is recognizing that, in fact, it's helpful to have uh, intermediate relational representations. There's a recent paper from DeepMind on relational networks uh, that shows dramatically improved performance from explicitly, first of all, representing the uh, good old-fashioned logical content of the image in terms of objects and spatial relations, interpersonal relations, grasping, and so on. Uh, and then, uh, on top of that, training to recognize uh, higher-level predicates or, or to give textual descriptions. Um, OK, so very briefly, where we are now, we've seen, uh, as we see uh, from the previous speakers, very rapid progress on several fronts. Uh, and Andrew Ng has uh, a useful description of where we're at right now. Anything that humans can do in one second, uh, we can probably automate reasonably well, um, uh, provided we have enough labeled data. Um, we also have uh, quite capable physical robots. Um, they are agile. Uh, for example, Boston Dynamics has uh, incredibly uh, good leg locomotion. Uh, and you know, clambering, climbing stairs, and so on. Uh, we have very agile flying robots. Uh, we don't have particularly good uh, dexterity at the moment. This is a puzzle. Uh, it may be a chicken and egg problem that robot hands and the algorithms for controlling robot hands have really lagged behind uh, the rest of the field. But I assume this will get solved uh, quickly enough. We have perception. It's not perfect, but it's good enough to navigate successfully uh, in the real world, as we've seen with cars. We have very good uh, short horizon tactical decision making, as we've seen in Go. Um, but remember, you know, in Go, you can beat the best human by looking ahead 20 or 30 steps. But in deciding to come here, when you look at the, what are the primitive actions required for you to participate in this meeting, uh, it involves something on the order of a couple hundred million steps uh, for you to be here and, and be sitting down listening to this talk. 
Okay? And so there's simply no way that you can scale up uh, what AlphaGo did, uh, looking ahead 20 or 30 steps, to, to hundreds of millions or billions of, of steps, uh, which are the kinds of activities that humans engage in. Um, and of course, humans do that by uh, operating not at the level of primitive moves on the board or move, movements of their hands and tongues and so on, but actually uh, higher levels of abstraction, like you know, booking a flight, you know, choosing to take the train from um, from New York down to D.C., for example, uh, you know, taking a taxi or an Uber. Those are the things that we decide about, and that gives us the scope uh, to make decisions that cover billions of time steps in the real world. Um, there's also been progress in, in complex parabolistic knowledge representation and reasoning. This is much, much less visible than what's been happening in deep learning, uh, and it's happened more slowly. The first papers in this area um, uh, in 1997, so it's about 20 years uh, that we've been doing parabolistic knowledge representation and reasoning uh, at the level of full, the full expressive power of Turing machines. Um, and that's a, that's a really big deal. I'll just give you one example from our own group. Um, so many of you are familiar with the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which bans nuclear explosions, and the UN organization, the CTBTO in Vienna, uh, has built uh, a very impressive monitoring system with hundreds of seismic stations spread all over the world. Um, and then all that data is, is sent back to Vienna uh, and then interpreted to detect the occurrence of nuclear explosions, uh, as well as all the other uh, significant seismic events that take place in the Earth. Um, so with these kinds of expressive parabolistic models, we can actually just uh, do this as Bayesian inference. Um, so. Uh, what we do is we write down uh, a model of what we know about the geophysics and the sensors uh, in a parabolistic programming language, um, and then uh, we just run inference. Um, and so we're not really writing special purpose software for interpreting uh, seismic data and solving the nuclear monitoring problem. We're simply writing down the geophysics and doing general purpose inference on the model. Um, and naturally, these languages can handle um, complicated, uncertain relationships. For example, the, the signals from seismic events are very complicated uh, and involve many different uh, types of waves with different velocities and paths through the Earth. Um, and the connection between detections and events uh, is completely uncertain. It's like listening to a thousand extended conversations all running at the same time, overlapping each other, uh, and then trying to figure out who was saying what, when, and where. And um, but this is, the, this is the model. It took me about half an hour to write um, and took a little while to get the inference to run fast enough to handle all the data coming from the whole planet in real time. Um, and then uh, these are the results. So this shows the, uh, the, basically the, the failure rate of the existing UN system. So between 30 and 50 percent of seismic events of significant magnitude are missed by the existing United Nations uh, automated system. And then this is the failure rate of the system that we built with the model that I just showed you um, called NetVisa. And so between two and threefold reduction, uh, here's uh, detecting the 2013 DPRK nuclear test. We got a much more accurate location than the combined efforts of all the world's geophysicists uh, who produced that, uh, the green triangle on the top left, and ours is quite a bit closer to the true location. Um, and then we have a more sophisticated model, which I can't really explain. It has a lot more uh, detail in, in uh, how we uh, write the geophysics of the structure of the signal itself. Um, but just to point out that in the, in the low magnitude ranges, one to two, we're actually finding 20 times more events uh, than not only just the UN automated system, but actually the expert geophysicists who work full time at the UN uh, to analyze all this data. Um, and we're even finding using just 10 seismic stations that are thousands of miles away, uh, more events than the US array, which has thousands of detectors and was right on top of the region uh, at the time this data was collected. Um, so we can see this kind of performance improvement. Uh, and it's not done by deep learning. Uh, we have very little training data. Um, and um, you can think of what's going on as a kind of a deep generative model. In fact, if I, I should probably stop showing this. 
right, which is the model uh, in the formal language that we have. And I should show you pictures of uh, hundreds of thousands of random variables being generated and, and then deleted and regenerated and restructured in real time as the inference proceeds. And then you'd all be impressed and say, oh, wow, it's just like the brain, right? Uh, <laughs> But it's, in fact, it's exactly the same thing. This is a, this is a deep generative model with about eight to 10 layers. Uh, and when there's a lot of seismic activity, it can have 500,000 to a million random variables that are dynamically generated. Uh, and then inference processes are operating on those. OK. Um, show you a completely different example. This is a model in the, using the same modeling language for, uh, for uh, natural language. So the model basically says there's a, there's a real world in which um, there are some objects and there are some relations, and some of the objects are related by some of the relations. Uh, and then there's a way of expressing relations in text. Uh, and then um, you choose some things that are true in the world, and you say them using the way of expressing relations in text, and that produces the text. Um, so that's what the model says, literally. Uh, nothing more than that. Um, we provide a bunch of text data from the New York Times that was helpfully pre-processed by Andrew McCallum's group. Uh, and then we just ask, well, what's true? So this is completely unsupervised. So we're just writing this completely generic model that it has no, no knowledge of which language we're talking about, no, language, no knowledge of what's true in the world, no knowledge of what relations exist in the world, it has to discover all of that for itself. And, um, and so here's an example of what it discovers. So one, it discovers a couple hundred relations. Here's one of them, number 46. Uh, and this is the, these are the textual patterns that are um, used to express relation 46 when you want to write down a sentence in English. Uh, and when you look at these, these all turn out to be that one object is a subsidiary of another. Um, and so it's discovered this subsidiary relationship and the 16 ways that that's written in the New York Times. Uh, and then you can also ask, well, what, what facts hold uh, for relation 46 in the world? Uh, and it tells you all those facts. Okay, and these with more than 95% accuracy with no training data whatsoever. Okay, um, so one of the questions raised uh, in the, the, uh, the telephone call we had with Fred is uh, where, where are we, the US, uh, where is the rest of the world? Um, my impression has been that, um, as has been true since the beginning of the field, that uh, the US and the UK are, are still far ahead uh, in basic research in terms of pushing the frontier, uh, solving these uh, fundamental problems that we have. Um, the other countries are not really contributing all that much. Uh, I guess I should add in Canada, I, sorry. <clears throat> Apologize to Canadians. Uh, obviously, Canada could contributed quite a lot to the deep learning. Um, and uh, China, there's no question that China sees AI as a huge a uh, key technology for strategic dominance. Um, and I visited probably uh, 10 times in the last couple of years, talking to lots of different groups. Uh, so there's enormous level of interest um, and some very, very impressive uh, capabilities, particularly um, in user-facing technologies like speech recognition, uh, where companies like um, Tencent are uh, doing some great work, uh, Baidu, the the Chinese analog to Google also has some really impressive stuff, and Andrew Ng was contributing to them for a while. Um, also, their uh, their quad rotors, um, their their sort of small uh, consumer drone capabilities are actually probably better than uh, the U.S. So DJI has about 70% of the mid-range market in the world. So um, so it's clear that uh, and, and they just announced a huge new. A program to invest in research and development in this area. So when, when China puts a big chunk uh, of resources behind something, you can expect that they will catch up fairly quickly. Um, one of the things that we see in China, in Europe, uh, in the US, everywhere, is that uh, the rate of growth of the industry is outstripping the ability of academia to keep up, to, to supply highly trained people, uh, and that's being exacerbated by uh, companies stealing academics um, uh, so that, uh, for example, Stanford has been kind of wiped out, uh, is not really able to, to produce high quality PhDs for, they'll have to regrow their AI group. Um, and uh, CMU's had some losses. Uh, we haven't seen that happen at Berkeley yet, but it could happen uh, any day. 
Um, and then finally, I think uh, that there's too much focus on deep learning uh, at the, uh, to the exclusion of these other areas that I think are really important uh, and actually will contribute to, to solving the problems that deep learning is running up against in terms of its capabilities. Um, so in the national security area, there are lots of things to be gained from AI. Um, I already gave an example of monitoring, um, early warning systems, situation assessment. These all uh, help uh, strengthen your defensive capabilities. Um, doing intelligence analysis, uh, I'm not privy to what goes on inside NSA in terms of how they interpret their data, but last time I visited, I, knew, I know that they were doing probabilistic programming, so that's a good sign. Um, uh, but presumably, particularly as we make progress on natural language understanding uh, and behavior recognition, uh, we will see the ability to, uh, to use AI systems to analyze in detail the entire signal collection capability output um, of the US. It's also important, and this was a point that, uh, that was made in a dinner I went to with Henry Kissinger, um, that if you can change the nature of military tactics in ways that, ha that no human has previously conceived, uh, that could have a revolutionary effect. You could completely change the strategic balance without necessarily changing the assets, but just the way you use them to construct military campaigns. Uh, and we saw that to some extent with this idea of getting inside the decision loop uh, in the first Gulf War where we could make decisions so much faster than the Iraqis that it was really no contest. But you could see similar things happening uh, with the ability of AI systems, as happened in Go, for example, where they just play in revolutionary ways that humans never thought uh, could be right or feasible, and all of a sudden it turns out that we were wrong, uh, and the machines figured out new ways of doing things. Um, and just looking optimistically, uh, if the AI revolution comes to pass uh, with uh, robot manufacturing um, and uh, AI systems doing all kinds of, of work, we should have much greater productivity and global wealth and less resource competition uh, between countries, which can't be bad. Now, on the risks, um, Rao pointed out there are many additional risks coming from uh, both AI systems being used as weapons in cyberspace uh, and arguably some of, some of the malware already is simple kinds of AI, but um, you know, particularly the, the techniques people use to get through spam classifiers and, and produce uh, emails that are uh, misclassified. Um, but we will see more and more of that, and as more and more of our economy is based on AI systems doing things, uh, that, ex that expands the uh, attack surface. I do want to talk a little bit about lethal autonomous weapons, uh, and I put that on the nefarious side, even though, of course, some people might think that expands US military capability, uh, I'm going to argue that's a mistake. Um, the uh, economists now, um, having poo-pooed the idea of technological unemployment uh, for decades, uh, now seem to be coming around to the idea that, in fact, this time it is different. Uh, and I've heard several of the world's leading economists say that this is the biggest threat that the world economy faces, uh, that we will see uh, over the medium term, 15, 20, 25 years, uh, really significant disruption to the economy that could cause major societal problems. And then finally, the existential risk. Uh, are we able to control super intelligent machines that we build? Um, so in cyberspace, uh, as you, many of you know probably much more than I do, uh, the stuff that's going on is really amazing. Um, I was having a conversation with um, a cybersecurity expert, I think it was at the World Economic Forum, and I was just sort of tossing off, you know, the speculative idea that you could build AI systems that would read people's email, figure out what they were doing that they shouldn't be doing, uh, and then do a kind of customized blackmail um, of, of that person based on what that person was doing wrong. Uh, and he said, well, actually, that's already going on. Uh, <laughs> and they actually use reinforcement learning so that, you know, when they make money from that, they, that, that you know, they get better at doing it, uh, using, using money as the reinforcement signal. Um, and I think when that starts to happen at large scale, uh, then that's really sort of damaging the quality of life of pretty much everyone on the planet. Um, we've already seen um, the use of fake news to change political behavior, uh, and that's going to get worse as we, for example, synthesize 
perfectly realistic uh, video of any human being doing anything you want. Uh, it's very hard to, to take that out of your mind once you've seen it, even if you later find out, oh, that was a fake, right? It's, it's seared in your consciousness forever. Um, and uh, I, I really think we need to do something uh, quite serious to, to uh, put a stop to this. Um, just straightforward stealing of cash uh, is now uh, uh, a very large business, um, probably getting up there towards the, the scale of the oil industry. Um, and uh, talking to uh, executives from, from very large international banks, they are seeing their customers no longer use um, uh, electronic data interchange uh, for financial transactions. That's a real problem when that happens. So when a company that does 10 million transactions a year has to use fax with voice confirmation for every single transaction, uh, then you know something is seriously wrong uh, with our, the security of our electronic infrastructure. Um, and I would say that our, our, we're leaving our populations unprotected, um, and uh, our AI systems are also going to be unprotected. So, for example, if I have uh, an AI system that can go shopping on my behalf, uh, the chance that it's going to get defrauded is going to be 100 percent, right? It's, you know, this is not just, you know, ostriches and buses. Uh, this is just, you know, small print, you know, fake goods, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be really hard for AI systems not to be uh, subverted in that way. Um, so I, I think we need to have some rules of the road. Uh, and we don't have to start with, you know, a law saying that everyone has to tell the truth on the internet uh, and the government's going to dictate what the truth is, but we can have some very simple rules. And, and um, part of it is promoting a basic human right to mental security. We have a human right to physical security, and governments, that's one of the first duties of governments is to provide that to its citizens, uh, both from against crime and against invasion. Uh, but mental security, meaning the right to live an, in an information environment that is largely true, uh, is extremely important. Um, and, you know, we right now, uh, the U.S. has invested um, about five billion person years, five billion person years uh, in getting itself educated. And then we, un we allow it to be undone uh, by false information. That seems like a really crazy uh, equation. Um, Okay, so let me briefly talk about lethal autonomous weapons, so weapons that can by themselves locate, select, and eliminate human targets. Uh, and there are simple forms already, landmines, and, and they're so stupid that they were banned. Um, so let's, make them, let's <laughs> make them more intelligent. So we have a sentry robot, which is kind of a landmine with a machine gun that can see people uh, and then kill them. Um, and then uh, Israel has a missile that can, can uh, loiter for many hours around a geographical region when it finds something that matches a, a, a target criteria, which could be a radar signature, but it could also be a visual signature, for example, something that it thinks is a tank, uh, like a school bus in Armenia, um, then it will dive bomb it and destroy it. So um, the real problem is not uh, the Harrett missile, which is about 25 feet long and has a 500 pound payload, um, but this, right? This is uh, something that you know, wholesales for about a dollar. You can buy them for, for five or six dollars in uh, toy stores. And um, the capability of those systems to attack individual people, right, to, uh, to identify humans and uh, to kill them. How does it kill them? Um, well, you only need one gram-shaped charge to blow a hole in nine millimeters of steel plate. So it's easy to see that that thing can easily carry uh, a one gram payload. Uh, and land on your head and blow a hole in it. So it's not hard to figure out that you can, uh, you can make micro UAVs that are lethal. You can put about three million of those in one regular container um, and do a lot of damage. And it's a very asymmetric kind of weapon. It doesn't require a huge military industrial complex uh, you know, with, with a large standing army and all the rest of it to have that kind of, of impact. And in that way, it's completely different. Even though you know, Kalashnikovs are very lethal, uh, and you could get three million Kalashnikovs, it's a bit bigger than a container, you know, a small ship, but um, you can't do anything with three million Kalashnikovs, right? Unless you have three million soldiers to carry them, which means you need to have 20 million people to train and support and transport all those people, uh, and you need a nation state. But with the autonomous weapons, it's completely scalable uh, and doesn't require 
uh, or the apparatus of a nation state. Um, so you're creating weapons of mass destruction that are scalable, uh, and I think, you know, if, if, if uh, someone wanted to put a serious effort, a kind of Manhattan Project, into this, it doesn't require any breakthroughs in AI. It's easier than a self-driving car uh, and could be done in less than two years. So the U.S. is already working on defensive technology against these kinds of swarm weapons, uh, and I would recommend that that be, that be shared to reduce the incentive uh, to develop the offensive weapons, um, and that we need a treaty banning at least the anti-personnel uses of autonomous weapons. Um, coming back to the, the attack surfaces of AI systems, um, another issue with uh, autonomous weapons is that they are hackable, uh, like any computer system. Uh, and so if your defense posture is based largely on hackable weapons, uh, you don't even know if you have any weapons. You might think you have weapons, but in fact they're weapons that now belong to the other side. Um, and so this, this may not be the most secure way to build your defense posture. Okay, um, so in terms of going forward, looking ahead into the future, um, I think my list of what's really missing in current uh, AI technology is a little bit different from Rao's, but um, one of the things we lack is real understanding of language, but I believe this will happen relatively soon because the, the commercial incentive is so huge and I think we have many of the pieces of the puzzle uh, already. Um, an integration of learning with knowledge, uh, coming back to this idea of one-shot learning or, or low-shot learning, how do, you, uh, how do you learn from few examples? You learn from few examples by knowing a lot already uh, about the domain in which the examples are occurring. Um, I mentioned this idea that we plan over very long time scales. At the moment, we know how to do that if the human supplies the levels of abstraction. But we don't know how to do it when the human doesn't supply that. We don't know how to make learning systems construct those levels of abstraction in behavior automatically. But again, we have many of the pieces of that, uh, and that progress could happen fairly quickly. Um, so they require conceptual breakthroughs, but it's very unpredictable to say uh, how long uh, it's going to be before those occur. And um, I always like to give the example from nuclear physics that uh, on September 11th, 1933, uh, the, the established wisdom was that there was no possibility we would ever be able to extract atomic energy from atoms. Um, on September, tw September 12th, so 16 hours after Rutherford gave a very famous speech saying it was impossible, uh, Leo Zillard invented uh, the chain reaction. <laughs> Right, so, so don't bet against human ingenuity. Uh, and it's odd. So, so Rao, Rao was saying, well, we've gone from uh, you know, AI, oh, so sad, pathetic, doesn't work, to, oh, you know, please don't kill us. Right? But within the AI community, the reaction has been the reverse. Right? We've spent 60 years saying we're going to achieve human level AI. Now somebody says, well, you know, if you do, that'll be really bad. And then we say, oh, no, well, we'll, we'll never do it, right? You know, this is impossible. It's way, you know, it's way, 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 centuries away. It's way too difficult. We can't possibly get there, right? Uh, which is really weird. Um, okay, so assuming that's true, that we will eventually make better decisions than humans, and I think that is true, um, we can certainly have machines that know way more. As soon as they can read, they can read everything the human race has ever written. Right? You know, humans can't do that. We can't read everything we've ever written, but a machine can. Uh, and uh, you know, if we solve a couple of those problems about levels of abstraction, we'll have machines. They can look further into the future. Uh, just as AlphaGo can on the Go board, they'll be able to do that in the real world. Um, and this is not a new thing. Right? Here's a quote. If we could keep the machines in a subservient position, for instance, by turning off the power at strategic moments, we should, as a species, feel greatly humbled. Um, so this is... This is not Elon Musk or Stephen Hawking, right, who arguably are not AI researchers. This is Alan Turing. Um, and if that's the problem, right, so that this sort of vague unease that you make something smarter than yourself, you're going to be in trouble, right? This is what we might call the gorilla problem. So their ancestors made something smarter than themselves, namely us. And uh, here they are having a meeting to discuss whether that was a good idea. <laughs> And you can guess, you can kind of guess just from the facial expressions, they're, they're pretty sure this was a terrible idea, <laughs> right? Um, but then, the, you know, what's the response to that? Well, I mean, you know, the response to that is we better stop doing AI. And I think that's neither possible nor desirable because, as I said earlier, there's lots of great things AI can do. 
Um, so we have to understand why is it a problem? Why is making better AI worse, right? What's, what's the reason? And the reason uh, is, uh, was stated quite clearly by Norbert Wiener in a paper in 1960, we better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Because I said, AI is about making machines that you know, act optimally in pursuit of their objectives. And if they have different objectives from ours, uh, then because they're more, pretentively more intelligent than us, then they get their objectives and we don't, right? It becomes like a chess match between machines and humanity because we put the wrong objectives into the machine. Even if it's something that sounds benign, like cure cancer, right? Well, you know, there's a quick way to cure cancer, which is to make everybody in the world into a, a guinea pig in experiments with various drugs, right? Well, that wouldn't necessarily have a good outcome for the human race, but that was what the objective was put into the machine. So we have to make sure that we don't put the wrong objective into the machine. And this is something that goes back in human mythology for millennia. Uh, King Midas is a perfect example. He said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. He got exactly the purpose that he put into the machine. Um, and then he regretted it, because that was not, in fact, what he really wanted, uh, but it's what he said he wanted. OK, so how do we get around this? Um, well, I, I don't want to go into all the math, but there's, there's basically some simple points. Um, the first is that when you design machines, um, they should be designed only to optimize human objectives, not their own objectives. They don't have any objectives. Because I don't care how happy the machine is and how fulfilled it is uh, and how well it achieves its objectives. I only care about my objectives. Uh, and so that should be the, the first rule. Um, the second point is that the machine has to be explicitly uncertain. So if you like humble, uh, it knows that it does not know what exactly the human wants. Uh, and this turns out to be crucial. But then it, there is a method of finding out what humans want, which is observing their behavior. Um, so before you get all upset about, well, whose values, you know, Christian values, Islamic values, fundamentalist values, no, none of those things. Right? I'm not talking about ethical codes. Uh, I'm not talking about touchy-feely notions of human values. I'm simply talking about uh, individual preferences over what life you want uh, compared to lives you don't want. Right? Uh, so it's, there isn't one set of values, and the robot doesn't have to adopt, in fact, does not adopt any of these values. Right? It simply learns to predict what humans want and then tries to help them get it. That's it. Okay, so it's very straightforward. Um, and so to learn from human behavior involves what we call inverse reinforcement learning, um, which basically means that by, when you observe the behavior of some other agent that you assume to be intelligent, uh, you can figure out from the behavior what is the objective, what's the underlying purpose that's generating this behavior. And that's, in fact, the most succinct explanation for the behavior. Uh, so just to give you a simple example, right? So this is me in the morning, all right? So you can tell what it is that I want, okay? So a very straightforward concept. Um, and in fact, there's a huge amount of evidence uh, that we can use to, um, to learn uh, about human objectives from human behavior. So pretty much every book that's ever been written describes people doing things, and then other people being upset. I go, even go back to, you know, Babylonian clay tablets, right? They say, you know, I traded five cows for 40 bushels of corn, uh, which tells you right there something about the human utility function. But, you know, the corn was rotten, uh, and now I'm going to kill him, right? So this is the kind of story that, that you see uh, in these clay tablets all the time. Um, but, you know, we can also have the machines watch TV or, or just observe humans directly. So there's massive... Uh, amounts of evidence uh, of what it is that humans choose to do. Uh, and if you can invert through, and the tricky part is inverting through the human cognitive structure, which is very complicated, to get at the underlying preference structure over lives uh, that the machine is going, then going to use to make sure that it doesn't do things that make us unhappy. Um, so there are some complications here. So the first is that that the standard theory of inverse reinforcement learning, which has been around for 20 years, is not quite right. Uh, for one thing, right, if, if the machine observes me wanting coffee, I don't want the machine to want coffee. Uh, that's not right. 
right? I want the machine to understand that I want coffee and then to learn how to help me get it. But also, um, if I want, if I have a robot in my house and I want it to learn what it is that I want, then I'm not going to behave the same way as I would if the robot wasn't there, right? So it's really it becomes a, a two-player game, not a not a one not one uh, human being observed through a two-way mirror by a robot watching the behavior, but actually a cooperative process. Um, so you can set this up uh, directly in game theory, and the human, uh, as it were, knows the value function, right? So they act according to their own value function. Um, the robot doesn't know it, but wants to maximize it. So that's the basic setup. Um, and then when you, when you look at the solutions, the optimal solutions of this game um, have the right kinds of properties that you want. So the robot will uh, ask questions first. It won't just act and do something that, that may be quite risky. Uh, it will actually ask you whether this is okay. Uh, and the human will also have an incentive in this game to teach the robot to act in such a way that the human preferences are more explicit. Um, and in fact, uh, it changes the fundamental assumptions of inverse reinforcement learning. The human will no longer act in a way that would be optimal if the human were, were just acting by themselves. Um, and therefore, the inverse reinforcement learning uh, agent, the robot in this case, should not assume that what it's observing is optimal behavior in the single agent sense. Let me give you one example. Uh, remember, Alan Turing said maybe we could switch off the machine. Right? Um, so, but you could ask, well, why would the machine, you know, let you switch it off, right? It's a super intelligent machine. It's not like it couldn't think of that, <laughs> right? And it's got some objective, you know, even something like fetch the coffee. And it reasons to itself, okay, well, I can't fetch the coffee if I'm dead, so I need to make sure that no one kills me, no one switches me off, right? And this was a point made by Steve Omohundra a few years ago, and it's one of the prime arguments as to where the risk comes from. Uh, that machines will defend themselves against attempts to change their objectives or to switch them off. Um, and it seems like when you put it that way, well, of course, you know, no matter what the objective, you can't do it when you're dead, so pretty much every machine is going to defend itself against being switched off. How can we prevent that? And the answer is, if the robot is uncertain about the objective, and it understands that the human knows more about the objective than it does, then it reason, reasons to itself, okay, the human might switch me off, but only if I'm doing something that the human doesn't like. I don't know what that is, but I don't want it to happen, right? I don't want to do something that the human doesn't like, so I will welcome being switched off, because that will prevent a catastrophe, and that's my goal, okay? And so, uh, in fact, you can just do the mathematical calculation and prove a theorem that it's in the robot's interest to allow it, uh, and uh, if you take away that uncertainty, so as the variance of the prior over the human objective goes down to zero, the robot's incentive to allow itself to be switched off also disappears. So this is a fundamental safety construct that the machine has to be uncertain about human objectives in order to be safe. Um, and you can show that machines that are built this way with this kind of uncertainty and the ability to learn from observing hum human behavior uh, can be provably beneficial. So you can prove that the human is better off with this machine than without it. Okay. Um, so the, the most fundamental consequence of this, actually, we have to go back to the definition of AI and say, no, we got it wrong. Uh, it's not about building systems that maximize their objectives. It's about building systems that maximize our objectives, even when they don't know what they are. Um, so you can build template designs for safe AI. Uh, and I think we'll start to see these as, we, as AI moves into the real world in cars, in personal digital assistants that can empty your bank account by accident, for example, you know, smart homes that can freeze you to death, uh, domestic robots that can accidentally uh, trample on your cat or cook it. Um, you know, then you start to need to have the machine understand that you know, the nutritional value of a cat is less than the sentimental value of a cat, <laughs> for example. Right? That's really important part of human value system. Um, so even if we solve that problem, right, even if we know how to build provably beneficial AI systems, there's no guarantee that humans will follow those guidelines, right? They, they may still want to take over the world using AI as a tool to, to fulfill their evil plan. Um, so that's sort of the cybercrime issue in spades. If we don't solve the cybercrime issue, then we're not going to solve this either. So I really hope people will uh, get, um, get more serious uh, than we are already about cybercrime. So in conclusion, we're making a lot of progress. There are all these potentially great 
positive consequences, um, some really bad negative consequences, um, and uh, I think many reasons to coordinate the activities uh, at many levels to try and make sure this comes out the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>